Hello and welcome back to the School for Writers podcast. Today we have Roxanne McDonald, who you might know from the internet as the person who runs Spiritual AF. She's very popular on Instagram and TikTok, and today you're going to find out why. She has this beautiful way of connecting spirituality and hilarity together, personal development and writing, and just being herself and showing up vulnerable. And today on the podcast, she's going to tell you what it actually means to show up vulnerable and to talk about your passions, your goals, and your life's desires on the internet. Roxanne is also going to talk with us today about alternatives in publishing and encourage you all to think outside of just the traditional style of publishing. I love how she says it. We have the opportunity to do it our way right now in the publishing industry. So why not? Whether you're going to publish card decks like she did, or whether you're going to traditionally publish, self-publish, whatever your publishing is, style is, this interview with Roxanne is going to help you feel more comfortable and confident in knowing what you want for your vision of your book and going and getting it. Also, Roxanne defines the craft of writing in a way that blew me away and absolutely made me think and was the best definition of craft and how to practice craft that I've ever heard of. So you absolutely want to keep listening and get that for yourself because it was very inspirational for me. And I've been in the writing world. I've been taking writing classes for three decades now, and that was the best definition of craft I've heard. So definitely want to keep listening and grab yourself that tidbit. Here's a little bit more about Roxanne before you delve in. Roxanne McDonald has dedicated herself to helping people find their voice on both the page and in their lives. She currently leads writing groups and personal development retreats in Santa Cruz, Carmel, and Monterey. For 14 years, Roxanne was on the management team of two alternative high schools focused on serving at-risk youth. Roxanne taught creative writing, poetry, and memoir writing in alternative schools and produced 11 anthologies of student writing. 11 anthologies, that's amazing. She has studied with Ellen Bass, Marcy Allen Craig, Joseph Stroud, Barbara Bloom, Jessica Brown, and Andy Courtier. She's an alum of the Community of Writers at Squaw Valley, the Bread Loaf Sicily, and is a member of Cheryl Strade's Writers Camp. Roxanne won the Mary Lawnberg Smith Award in Poetry, and her short stories, memoir excerpts, and poetry have been published in the Porter Gulch Review. She won the Eshleman Scholarship for the Community of Writers at Squaw Valley. Roxanne received an honorable mention in nonfiction for the San Miguel de Allende Writers Conference Writing Contest for an excerpt from her memoir. She was longlisted in the 2021 First Pages Prize and is a finalist in the 2021 Sandra Carpenter Prize for Creative Nonfiction. Roxanne is the author of the best-selling self-help deck Spiritual AF and Grateful AF, which you should go out and buy both of you that haven't, don't own them yet, published by Knock Knock Publishing. Roxanne holds a BA in Interdisciplinary Education from California Institute of Integral Studies and an MFA in Creative Writing from Pacific University. That is quite an impressive resume there, quite an impressive bio. Roxanne is an amazingly accomplished writer and super fun and hilarious to talk to. So I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I enjoyed having on Roxanne McDonald. Welcome, Roxanne, to the School for Writers podcast. I'm really excited to have you on. I'm really excited to connect with you again. We've connected before in person. We've met in person, and now it's great to get to digitally interview you as well. Uh, why don't you tell us, I just did your formal bio. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do in this world? Uh, um, so I, yeah, I'm Roxanne McDonald. I am a writer. I am a writing teacher, a coach, and uh, it's hard for me to say it because I just feel funny, but I, you know, a social media influencer. Yeah, um, own that. You are an influencer. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, uh, yeah, I'm an influencer. And I, I also teach personal development and mindfulness classes uh, as because I was a counselor in my last uh, uh, iteration. So I, uh, yeah, I think that about sums it up. I love that. Why writing? I'm going to ask you the first question we ask everybody right off the bat. Why writing? You know, I, I run weekly writers groups with like a, you know, it's, it's a mix of writers, but most of them are very dedicated. And I, I ask this question a couple times a year and I love it. So I just want to say that. And that the, so the, when I ask this question, I get reinvigorated with why I choose to write. And mo the, the core part is that 
I actually like my life and my myself better when I write. And it is my chosen way of honing something, the, the honing the ability to be present, honing the ability to savor, honing the, my curiosity. Um, so that's like the undercurrent. The, the other part is that like most writers, I loved reading and it was this solace for me from the time I can remember. And then having that, that awareness that I could someday be a part of that and be like, somebody could read me. Like, I think that that just, like, I remember thinking like when I, I, I remember getting books from the library when I was five and then coming into the library and then this, you know, the woman explaining that a person had made them, that it wasn't just books were a thing that they, like a dog, you know, or like books exist and that's where they are. And then it was like, no, a person made it and that you can grow up and be a person that makes these. And I just was like, that's what I want to do. Like a hundred percent. And the idea of just being a part of that seems fantastic. And it always has for me. You brought up such a good point. I, I don't know the moment in which I realized that books were written by humans and I could be one of those humans. Mm-hmm. But there had to have been a point in all of our lives as writers where we're like, oh, I could do this thing. Mm-hmm. For me, it was more like, oh, all these lies I keep getting in trouble for telling could actually be something I could monetize <laughs> and, exactly. and put into something. Like, it's not a bad yeah. thing that I make up all these stories. Um, yeah, so I remember that mm-hmm. moment, but I don't remember the moment where I realized that a book was written by somebody. And I'm sure that's a powerful moment for you. I'm glad that you can remember that. Well, I was, I mean, I, I learned to read with, my mom taught me how to read and she would, um, she, she would anthropomorphize the letters. Hmm. So every letter had a, a personality and it was like, you know, like capital G had a big belly and laughed all the time and that kind of thing. And I think that I really did see books as all of these personalities of these letters kind of coalescing and you know they were hanging out in this thing and so I think that's kind of why I really had a dis like where I just thought like ants have ant farms and letters have books and then when I you know and then I think I even sometimes when I'm writing I'll get like where I'm I'm more just like a wrangler like I'm just trying to get all these like weird personalities like the words together and to put you know to get them in line and not more like I am using symbols to represent something that that kind of thing. It is a personality. They're all, yeah. That <laughs> weird brain. is the creative process right there. It's so true. I talk a lot. I run a program called write your friggin' book already. And oh, so God. often people come in, they're like, this, I want to start with an outline. Cause I know exactly what my book is going to be. I'm like, cool. Start with the first draft and then tell me what your book is. And every single time I have a cohort halfway through their first draft right now. And they're just freaking out. They're like, the characters have their own personality. Mm-hmm. Or even if it's me writing a memoir, I'm different. And it's going its own way. And people are always so freaked out when the creative process has its own personality. And I love that from the beginning, your cre- like creativity and writing had its own personality and the characters had their own, their own, you were wrangling characters. I love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's so great. What are some ways, so you said that writing helps make you a better person. What are some ways in which you've noticed that writing makes you a better person? So in order to write the way that I want to write, and I I like, I try not to say write well or write bad, you know, so I'm just, if I'm stumbling, it's because I'm trying to just be like the way I want to write when I'm honing craft, um, that the level of detail that needs to happen the level, the, you know, when you're trying to write about a place and, and you, you have to pay attention and that the act of sitting down and going, I'm going to create a place in my mind and I'm going to describe it. Um, in order to describe it, you have to be able to look closely in your imagination, but to even kind of get there for me, I have to be, I have to spend time in my day being that conscious and curious and noticing. And, um, and, and so when I'm like that, when I'm in the midst of what, you know, my writing practice is going, I am way more conscious. Like I walk into a room and I'm like, wow, interesting. Like that, that she's got a weird little doll in the corner of her bookshelf. That's, mm, that's something. Or like, or I look at people and when you're writing characters and, you know, to make a character real, you you know, that you have to be able to like fall into at least awe of them for a bit. And that when I am doing that, and then I walk out into my life, I can sit with a friend and just be in awe of their like, 
the weird little crooked tooth right there, you know, or that the way their eyelashes like don't quite curl like other people's. They like one eyelash goes straight. And that thing makes me makes life sweeter. And it makes it it makes it exquisite in the sense of it can be beautiful and painful at the same time. And it makes me walk a little softer through my life. Oh my God. I took so many notes during all of that, that people that are watching on the YouTube, they can see me just like furiously scribbling. Cause that is so true and profound. I love that you said, you know, writing is the art of paying attention and it's being conscious. It's being curious. It's noticing things. I love what you just said that to make a character real, you have to appreciate their little quirks, things that we might hold against other people or ourselves. I just think that that's really beautiful and really brilliant. And I can see the personal development side of you when you talk about writing like that. And I, I truly know that writing can be extremely therapeutic. So I love, I love that you said that. And it brings me around to your, you know, we talked a little bit in your intro about you're kind, you're kind of a big deal on the internet and you you know, you're kind of a big deal. You've got leather bound mahogany books. And I'm from San Diego. We quote Anchorman way too much. Oh, okay. around here. <laughs> um, so I'd love to know, tell us a little bit about spiritual AF and how it got started and what it represents for you as a creator. Mm -hmm. I was a counselor for many years. I ran treatment programs for teenagers with substance abuse and gang affiliation. Um, and at the same time, I've always been a writer and I was taking, I was in writer's groups and I was doing these things. Um, and I was not on social media. I got off of social media as a way to like focus on writing. And then when I quit my job to become a writer full time, which I had no idea what I was going to, I thought I was like, I'll be a barista again. I, I just want to write. Um, I had been going to, uh, you know, conferences and watching, you know, watching videos about how to become a writer. And they were like, you need to have a social media platform at this point. And so it was coinciding. So I was going, I'm leaving this school that I had been a part of for many, many years. And the, the students who are graduating were like, but you were so, it was like, a, you know, we, I, I didn't let, like nobody graduate, nobody left. You could always come back. We'd always give you support. Right. And so they were like asking me, like, are you going to even be available to just give us pep talks? And so I, it was the, those two things, like I need to figure out social media if I am going to be a professional writer, as well as I still want to offer something to these kids that, that had offered, you know, uh, had allowed me to be a part of their health and well being. And so, you know, they were graduating, going to college. And so I just started making um, content that was this hybrid of like, incredible, like really personal um, develop, like spiritual stuff with like poop jokes. And you could be, you know, you could really care about uh, healing and self-esteem, but you can also just be like, uh, you know, dumb stuff is funny and that, and that access. And so that was the thing where I, I got on and I was like, well, I'm doing this for this community that I've already been doing this for, to just remind us all that gratitude works and you can say, you can say curse words and it still works. Um, and then it just morphed from there. So it just kept building as, as I went along where it turned less into me just putting this stuff out there for this, you know, niche audience and more me going, I'm going to, I'm going to show up on here for this community. And it just kept growing. And then of course I went and learned, I, I, I'm a person that will like go watch YouTube videos to learn something all the time. And so of course I watched YouTube videos and I put some dedication and consistency into it, but it's been mostly this, this thing of showing up and seeing like, well, how do, how do all my worlds intersect? And, you know, I teach people about, like, I teach writers or creatives about social media. And, and my thing about it is that it's like, it, of course, most of the rhetoric out there about building a platform is that you have to, you have to, you have to get your grid and it all needs to be the right color and you need to have on brand and you have to understand exactly what you're showing and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that is that's not how we engage. Like, that's not how we engage as humans. And as writers and creatives, what I see is that I buy books from people. And when people show up with generosity of spirit, with sharing, like, and, and when they show up and when I, when I'm talking to people about building social media, it, it's about cure, just sharing what you love. And I think that 
the, the vulnerability piece is I'm always intersecting like personal development, but the, the thing about writing and the thing about being a human is that I think we go around thinking that the most vulnerable thing that we're going to show other people is our deepest wound. And I truly believe that the most vulnerable thing we show people is what our deepest yearning is mm. and what we really want and what we love. And I think I went into social media and I went, what if I just curated all this stuff that I love? And it was scary, but I just keep showing up and going, hey, you know what I love now? You know what I'm thinking about? Oh, you know this thing? I love this person. Let's share that person. And that thing is is more magnetic than coming in and going, standing in a room and just going like, look at me and then buy something from me, which I think that's what social media is to what we think about when we're like going into it as an entrepreneur or a creative. Um, so that's like, so that was spiritual as fuck. It just kept, oops. Spiritual AM. You can you can cast as much as you want in here. We say okay. fuck all the time. We have okay. a, we have the E next to us for a reason. Sorry, okay. kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I got a lot of, I mean, I've gotten feedback. I have another platform called Writer's Resource, and it was me making memes about writing. And it's got like 20,000 followers, but I am really, I just try to be authentic with it. And I have been, you know, going through stuff and I'm way more interested in the spiritual AF and as well as like, I just kind of, I'm, I'm like, I, I liked my memes over there and I was sharing like resources for writers, but I actually was like, uh, I, I think I like this over here more. And I just, you know, spiritual AF is kind of where I put the, I put it all now. I, I talk about writing. I talk about, I talk about my personal life. I talk about d development and I make, I, I po post a lot of like dogs being dumb, <laughs> you know? I think that that's what I love about it so much is it feels like it feels like the text thread between your best friends, <laughs> you know, like your best friends who are all into spirituality a little bit, but don't take it too seriously, who are into personal development, but also willing to laugh at themselves and who are also writers. It really does feel like I'm hanging out with you. It feels, you know, it feels like I am getting an insight into life and of and it feels really intimate yeah like it's like it's like a text thread of your best friend saying hey you should see this thing it's gonna make you laugh it's this dog and some poop and I love that idea of combining serious topics like spirituality like your health like writing like your career like these things that are serious and the hilarity of it all one of the things that I'm really interested in picking your brain about and in talking to you about is the process in which spiritual AF became, went from digital to physical. So tell us a little bit about how that happened. For those who don't know, you have two card decks, spiritual AF and grateful AF. And can you explain what a card deck is, what it looks like for people and how you took this digital concept and brought it physical? So the deck, the card decks are like, the idea was more, was like a tarot deck or an Oracle deck, or, you know, you know how people will just like, or angel cards where you pull out a card. Right. And, um, I had had this dream when I was working with teenagers to make a personal development, like a self-help book, but without all of the, like, I get self-help books and I'm like, Oh God, you're just trying to justify that you have a right to talk. Like, okay, I'm going to skip that chapter and I'm going to skip. And then I'll get this like three chapters in the middle that have the, like, here's some shit to do. And then they go like, and here's the, this guy did. And here's what that guy did. And I'm like, I don't read that stuff. And so I actually was for a while going and pitching to agents, these self-help books. And then they kept saying, literally, those people don't buy books those people don't buy personal development. And this was before the whole explosion of like um, the subtle art of not giving a fuck and unfuck yourself and all that stuff. Cause they were like, curse words don't work. You don't know that. And I just kept being like, well, then I don't want to do it. I don't want to do your book. I want to do me. And I just left it. So the card decks um, are my, I like my thing is like, uh, bite-sized self-help, bite-sized, like a mini, mini just moment where you can pull it. And it, it really, my idea about it was to make it so people who are um, just at the very, very beginning and will feel like that it's manageable. They can just pull a card and it says like, you know, uh, uh, you know, whatever, I'm trying to find one that's not too, um, like, 
pull a card that says heart is the new balls. And then it's got things about just like under, like honoring your heart as being the power source of your life. Right. And, um, and not having to read a whole book to get to that. Um, so that was, yeah, that was the idea. And it, I didn't quite, I never thought that I could make a card deck and it was this, um, I'm going to get into how it all happened. Is that? Yes, please. We'd love to know that all the writers here. And one of the things I'd love y'all to hear about is how Roxanne decided this is the thing and the feeling and what I'm going for. And then was open to the container that that came into. So I love that you just said that because so many people come, they're like, I need to write a book. It needs to be traditionally published. It needs to look like this. It needs to have this kind of cover. I've had the vision in my head forever. I'm like, yeah, but what does it feel like? What's the essence of it? So I love that you honed in on that essence. So yes, please tell us about the whole process of how it became published. So I backtrack. So as a, as a writer and I've been in the writing world and I, for a while, and I've done the stuff, like I send my, you know, I've gone to bread loaf and Squaw Valley and, um, Esalen. like Esalen's, you know, San Miguel de Allende, like, and I would go and to these conferences and there would be this, like, this intensity about like, you need to try to sit next to an agent. And then you, it's all just like gut cutthroat. You need to, and I'm like, I have never sat next to somebody at lunch for just to try to figure out what they can give me in my life. And I will not do it for this. And I was told you're not going to make it. You've got to play the game. Right. And I was like, I'm, I don't know. I'm just going to truck along and keep writing. My friend was in an elevator with this. I, I could, literally cannot remember who this famous writer was, but um, he's like Neil Gaiman at like that kind of big. And she asked him, do you have advice for up and coming writers? And he said, be a really nice person and write your ass off. Mm. And I, when I heard that, I was like, I'm going to do that. I'm just going to keep writing and I'm going to be a really nice person. And then I thought, well, maybe I won't publish. Maybe I'll just truck along living a life as a writer and teaching, you know, I figured out how to teach writing courses and I'm, I get to be talking and doing writing all the day. Um, and then I went to Esalen and uh, it's a writer's camp that it, Cheryl Strayed used to do it. And then now it's Samantha Dunn. Um, and I got, I, I teach there because I co I, the other thing is I show up, showed up and like, just, I, what used to happen long, long time ago is that if you wanted to be a writer, you would find the best writer in your area and you would just show up on their doorstep and be like, can I take out your garbage? Then can I learn from you? And I basically did that with Ellen Bass, who's a poet in my area. And, um, and so I kept tagging along with her to where we, then I'd be, I started teaching writing courses at Esalen. So I had this, I was going to Esalen several times a year, which Esalen is a, a retreat center in Big Sur. So then I was at Esalen at this writer's camp and there was a woman there who I had a headache and like, she couldn't, she didn't know where to get aspirin. And there was something with a pillow. And I just was like, oh, I know my way around here. I'll run up there. I'll talk to this person. I'll get this aspirin. And then I just checked on her throughout the week. And that was it. And, uh, and then a couple months later, I got a direct message on Instagram and I get, you get these ones. They're like, you're special. We want to do stuff, you know, and you're like, this is trash. Right. Um, so I got something where I was like, I would, you know, I, I uh, own this company. I'd like to publish you. And I just didn't even look. And then another few weeks later, I get something on Facebook where it says, Hey, this is Jen from Esalen. Remember the aspirin, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, Oh, so then I write her back and she happens to own a gift publishing company and which, you know, do, does, uh, cards and trinkets and stuff like that. Well, Turns out that she was looking at adding more meaning into the product she was doing. And she had met me there. And then she realized that she had been following spiritual AF and then put the two together. Mm. And part of, part of that putting it together was that I, um, I do gratitude as like a practice of just keeping my head above the fray. Like it really is one of the things I've done since I was a teenager. And I started writing gratitude lists on my page and it was a big jump for me and scary. But what she saw was she was like, oh, she can write and she's got all this stuff. So then she contacted me and was like, I'm really interested in what we could make together. And then I, and I was like, wow, weird. And so I just jotted down a ton of ideas 
everything that I had been told, like I just went everything, ev everything, every agent had told me that I couldn't do. I was like, sure, you want it? You want to try this? Let's, I want to, I want this. And then they flew me down to LA to meet. And I sat in this room and they, it would be, I was like, well, I mean, I could write a deck and maybe we don't put a curse word on it. And they were like, we, we want curse words. Like, no, no. And everything was more. And it was this thing where I was like, I just wrote my ass off and I was nice, but I also showed up and I've done the work. And then we worked together on the ideas. I'd never thought about a card deck. And then when they pitched it and it was like, these are our first two products together. I, I was like, these are, this is what I'm most excited about. And so that's how that happened. And then now we're like in a relationship where, you know, I, I can't say more, but the, um, I can say that I, you, people would go, say, oh, but you're going to be limited to like, you know, card decks and things. And that, um, as the world is changing, so is the publishing world. And so we are looking, I, I am about to get to do some more stuff that's even more writery and, but still in the vein of this, this thing, like of all this, like edgy personal development with some, a whole lot of playfulness. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, 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 yes. To so much of what you just said, I related through that whole process, I want to kind of go back to the beginning and, and talk about a couple of things you just mm -hmm. said. One, I have an issue with the writing world, the writing community, and I'm calling you all out that run writing conferences because so often there is this push to pay extra money to sit in front of an agent and pitch yourself. And so it creates this world where we come to writing conferences to try to become the next big thing and like almost with their ego in tech versus coming to learn. And I think about how many of the great friends that I have, I've met from what you said, be a really nice person, write your ass off and show up. I go to writers conferences all the time. I'm never there to find an agent. I'm never there to find a publisher. I am there to find friends. And I think that that's what I loved about hanging out with you at Esalen is, you know, you're one of those people when you meet them, you can tell you're just there to, to make friends with other writers. Writing can feel really lonely. So I love that you brought up that idea that sometimes we can show up to writers conferences and it can feel like a meat market. <laughs> it can feel mm -hmm. like a competition, like you're trying to prove yourself. And I love that instead of that, you, you know, you showed up with the aspirin and the pillow, you showed up being kind. I love that about you. And then I also love that that ended up allowing you to find someone who could meet you where you're at and, and meet you where your book and your, your product was at. The question I want to ask you is a question I have an answer to, but do you feel like there's kind of a, a, feeling in that writing world that you're not legitimate if you're not writing as a book with a traditional publisher that hits certain kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Does yeah. that, does that, a how has that played out in your world as a writer? Because I know so many of my authors are self-published. So many of my authors have published smaller books or different size books or different structures, or they've published card decks themselves and they feel like there's almost a stigma against them because they're not traditionally published in a traditional style. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on all of that? I will say, I agree. Yes, that there is a stigma. And I think that it comes from a old uh, structure that is dying and it's kind of bullshit. And I think, I, I mean, of course, like it's, I dream, like I have, I have a, um, I'm, I could tell stories for days, so I'm trying not to get into something, but, um, but the, the idea that we have to be validated through publishing is silly to me. And I personally, as a personal development practice, I was getting, when I was a teenager, I was getting like published for poetry. And I saw that I was like, I'm not going to be, this isn't what I want. And, um, and I pulled back from publishing for years and years, and I really don't focus on it. I focus on writing stuff and I focus on showing up and creating relationships. And I will say that because now when I, you know, it was in my MFA and I was looking at all these fantastic faculty that are writers, but who, ha who were like respectable writers don't have social media. They teach at colleges. They publish with indie presses or a big press. Um, but it's all about 
the world says that I'm worthy, therefore that. And then they don't sell books. They're mm-hmm. teaching in colleges. And I'm like, I'm like, I don't care then. I want, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm in the position of like, I just, I, I rather like right now is the time we, we don't need those big five publishers anymore. We don't need them. That's the thing that's happening. They're wonderful. Distribution is terrific. I'm not, I'm not telling this from the top of the hill because I have a memoir that has not sold yet. Right. But if you just show, if you show up and create community and, and do like the world, like social media, all the ways we're connected, we have so, we have the opportunity to do it our way. And, and that is not the old story. The old story is we needed an old white guy to say that we were good enough. And then to, we were subject to what they put out into the world. And a lot of that for me has come about getting okay with it is that I check, I check my ego about it. I check that I'm like, well, is it okay if people look down on me as a writer? Like I'm a writing teacher that doesn't have a a memoir, a full length book out. Right. I have like, I have, I have cards for, with the word fuck on them. Right. But it was like, I mean, it's hard work. You have to get 88 words on the back of a card. That's funny, inspirational, and edgy. And I, that took all of my skill, right? And I love them. If I am moving forward and I'm going to go and do hybrid publishing or I'm going to self-publish or if I choose, you know, the, like I think to just get our ego out of that and really look at like, what is the best thing for this, this book, this piece of this product, right? And the word, I don't know. I think it's changing so drastically. And of course it's completely fine. Like I have friends who are like, no, I want to, I want to, publish with an indie press. And then I want to get a job at a low residency MFA. And I'm like, that's terrific. I curse too much for that. (laughs) (laughs) I love what you said. We have the opportunity to do it our way. I think that there's, it's a, it needs to be a choice and it needs to be a choice that you make per book. It's not like, I'm only going to do this. I'm only going to do that. You're not only going to do cards. It's this project's essence this project style and feel needs to be done in this way. This is the goals for this project, for this creative endeavor. But first and foremost, I think we need to write to tell, not to sell. So I love that you said we have the opportunity to do it our way because we aren't, our hands aren't tied by the big five publishers that are all white men living in New York City. They, we can we can do our own. We can work in our own way. And I love that, that you found that. And I love that you teach that. Speaking of teaching, tell me a little bit more about your your teaching style, when you teach writing to people, what do you, you know, each person is different. What do you like to emphasize? I think being a counselor for so long that it's really creative counseling. And then I, so I do, and and with that, I'm like, I am obsessed with the craft of writing. Like if you talk to me about, you know, how sentences are put together, not grammar wise, but just like impact or like the, you know, you start getting me talking about how, like how to create characters or a story arc or like through line or blah, blah, blah. Right. But underneath that, when I show up, like I, I, I'm really specific about what I do. Like I don't do big, I don't do full manuscript editing because I don't want to sit down and then try to fix a whole bunch of problems. I'd rather work with a human being and go like, let me help you to do you better. And that's the thing, like Ellen, um, you know, Ellen's been teaching for over 50 years and she's, I, she's, I've really relied on her for a lot. And she really told me, she was like, you are not teaching well if all your students end up writing the same. So always be checking in when you're doing a writer's group and you start hearing that it's all similar, the similar fame, blah, 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 you're not teaching well. And so that's the, I really am like about voice, about people um, people really honing into what they really want to do. And I try to, I, I think of my, like when I'm, when I'm reading a person's work and giving feedback, it's like, I've got my nose down sniffing for what their intent is. Like, I'm looking for, what were you going for here? And then how can I, with all of my geeked out craft stuff, like kind of put you through some, uh, calisthenics as a writer so that you are capable of doing what you intended, not me going, this is a good way. That's a bad way. Go the good way. So when you talk about craft, first off, I loved all of that. Second, when you talk about craft, what do you, what does craft mean to you? What does it look like to work on craft? 
I mean, it, it means a ton. Um, the I think one of the hardest parts about writing is that um, because it's words and words are how we think and they're in our brains and then we go and it's our story and especially memoir writers, which I work with a lot, is that we it's it's somehow that we think it's like a, it's us. It's not a thing that we've created with painters. I've seen like, of course it's difficult and they have to go through, but they are clearly going, this is a thing I have made from my inspiration and creativity with writers. They, we go, these are my thoughts, emotions, and, and ideas. And we don't have, because we don't, when you're writing on a computer, that's just your thoughts, emotions, and ideas on, you know, in there. And instead of going, I think the craft is to go, I am, I have all my thoughts, emotions, and ideas, and I am making a thing with those. Hmm. And the craft is going, I am, I'm going to work on and hone this thing that I am making, not my ideas, not my thoughts, not who I am. But the other thing is that writing, especially personal essays and all this stuff is, um, Ellen, once again, I'm going to quote her is that I will every few months I go, I like cry, call her up crying. We go out to dinner and she goes, you have to become the person who wrote the thing. So you have to be changed by the writing in order for it to be dynamic. And so that showing up as a whole, a human being that's going, there's something here. I'm going to work on it. I'm going to da da da. Right. Um, it's, I think the craft of writing as well is that like being changed by the actual writing, like you said, it's like, do the first draft and then you'll figure out like, right. Do the first draft and you'll have an idea about what, what you really want to write about because you at the beginning of that draft and you at the end are going to be different. And then also craft, I think is just about becoming conscious of storytelling, becoming conscious of the, um, the way that words work, the way that sounds work, you know, um, becoming conscious of, uh, what is that? What is at the heart of what we're trying to say? What, what we're the story we're telling. I, I do a lot of work with just conceptualizing people's work, just going, it looks like, looks like what you're really talking about here is grief. Right. And, but you might be talking about basketball, but it does it, you know, and then, and then being able to conceptualize our own work in order to make it the thing that we want to make. Hmm. That was really beautiful. I've been to a lot. <laughs> A lot, a lot, a lot of writers' conferences. And I think that was probably one of the best explanations of craft is you were talking about it's turning our thoughts and ideas into a thing, a piece of art that is dynamic. And and you as the writer, you have to go through that. You can't just, so many people just want to jump to the end, myself included. You know, I just want the finished book that's profound. I don't want to have to be the profound person to write the profound book. I don't want to be my best version of myself. I just want to write a, a fluffy book that's on the New York Times bestseller list forever. It makes me famous. Come on. I mean, but I think that was one of the best, and I hope y'all go back and listen to it again. That was one of the best definitions of craft I've ever heard, mm. is this idea that it is the formation of our ideas into actually a piece of art, into something else be beyond our ideas. I, I, I just really love that. And I love that you said as a, as a writing instructor, your job is to like, let me help you to do you better. And I think that's great. I think that so often people are trying to make people artists like them versus letting people find the artists that they are. So mm -hmm. that is really beautiful. I have our last three questions that I ask people when they come on the podcast for you. And the first of which is, what is a book that you've read lately or at some point in your life that changed your life? I, I'm going to be so cliche. I'll just say the truth is that, um, <laughs> so it's so cliche. And can you guess what book I'm about to say? Be cliche, tell the okay. truth, go for it. <laughs> um, I, when I was I grew up in a rough, I grew up rough. Let's just like rough, rough. Right. So, and, um, I was like a gutter punk out, you know, drunk in the streets by like 12. Right. And I don't remember when I found proud pride and prejudice, but that book, something, there's something magic in that book. And I, I think partly it as a, as a, you know, as a cis woman and having a book that like, like 
you know, there is not a scene that doesn't pass the Bechdel test. And there is not, there's not a scene that doesn't, that doesn't pass the, um, you know, that fails the opposite way. Like we don't have to read about men talking about, you know, like that, but also there's something about that book that I remember, I like throughout my entire just gnarly like crime all this stuff I had pride and prejudice stuck in my book my boot my boot and I still like I fall asleep to it at night it's the most soothing it's the it reveals stuff to me that I um I like I mean I, I can't tell you how many times I've read it because I listen to it almost every day and I find language and wording and you know and all of that so I'll just say that pride and prejudice it was it has been my like life raft mm. I love that story. I have not made it through Pride and Prejudice. I think, <laughs> no, I would not have guessed you were going to say Pride and Prejudice. I'm a huge romance novel fan too. I feel like I just, okay, I just finished a book. I'm 10 books ahead of my goal for the year. So I have a little buffer. I'm going to read Pride and Prejudice. I'm going to just make myself finally read it. You do. And get, I mean, I, I, what I've talked to a lot of people through that book is that yeah, it'll feel like mm, from the beginning and then somewhere in the middle, people go click and then they, they get it. Okay. So. I'm giving Pride and Prejudice another yeah. chance. Thanks to you. And I will let you know how it goes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Please. My next question is, what is a book that you want to read, but you don't want to have to write it? Wait a, minute, a book that exists? Or, or a book that you would love to exist, but you don't want to have to be the one that brings it into existence. There's so many. <laughs> um, okay, I'll be honest. Um, I think there are some books out there that are getting close to it, but like being somebody who has been in the substance abuse recovery world for the vast majority of my life and then being a professional, I would really love to see a book that both honors the tradition of 12-step programs and the science of uh, addiction uh, recovery without disparaging either one and but then also deconstructing the pitfalls in each one and deconstructing especially the like white cis het middle class christian um male thing that has been in 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 both of those right so i would love and i i think there's people that have written some of it but they they don't quite know all the worlds enough for it to be the book that i would actually love to read but i have no interest in writing it and i actually i've I, i've veered away from that topic because i'm like i don't want to argue with people about this that is a reality like we want someone else to read it because we don't want to have to be the ones to argue on the internet about i don't want to argue about it on the internet <laughs> That's a thing. That's a thing. Way to know that. So if somebody I don't out want there to is myself about it to anybody. Yeah. So if somebody out there is listening, go write that book and let Roxanne know. Yeah. Or if you can well. talk, we can talk. I will. Yeah. I, I probably coach you through it for free. Cause I'd be like, well, <laughs> well I need this book. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. All right. <laughs> You're like, this is not a contractual agreement. Yes. <laughs> no. yeah. And our final question is, where can people find you if they want to read more about you, get your decks, mm -hmm. follow you? Where can people find you? There's, I, it's for some, I'm, it's silly because I'm like, for somebody who like did not do social media and I'm really private, you can basically find me anywhere at this point. So um, if you're interested in writing specifically, I have my website, which is roxannemcdonald.com. And then my name is spelled R-O-X-A-N. Not nothing else, just rocks in. It sounds like a chemical, and then McDonald like the restaurants MC. Um, and then you can also find me all over social media at spiritual underscore AF. Um, Instagram and TikTok are my main places. Um, TikTok, it's spiritual underscore AF, and I talk more about like personal development and boundary setting on there. Um, and then on Instagram, it's like a more of a mix of you know, writing and all that stuff. And then you can find me on Facebook, but I don't really like that place. <laughs> okay. I love it. I love it. And that's all of our questions. And y'all will have all of those links in the show notes. So you can go directly to the show notes and get them. They'll be in our bios on social media. So you can, um, you can easily click those and, and go and explore more of the spiritual AF world and Roxanne McDonald. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Roxanne, for coming on. I, it was changed honestly by your mm. definition of craft. So I'm so glad that we had this conversation. It was really profound mm. for me as a writer and as a writing teacher, and just as somebody who respects what you do out in the world. So thank you for coming on. 
Thank you so much for having me. I'm so, I feel so great. Yeah, this, this conversation has been terrific and it's horrible for me to say since I was talking most of the time, but you're lovely and thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for coming on and we'll chat with you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. This week's School Friday's book recommendation is Sissy, A Coming of Gender Story by Jacob Tobias. I listened to this on audiobook and I really enjoyed hearing Jacob's take on their life and their coming out. And I love the way that they talked about it as not a closet, but a snail. You kind of go back into your shell when life is hard and the world is hard. It's not this giant, woohoo, I'm open and out in the closet and you do it once and that's your queerness and that's your gender queerness and that's your gender. No, as a queer person, I know, and as a gender non-conforming person, I understand that coming out is something we do a lot, and sometimes we duck back into that shell when the world feels unsafe. And I really loved the permission that Jacob Tobiah gives in this book to explore myself, to explore my gender. I felt like them's telling their story and me understanding how they went about the journey and the way that they were shoved back in their shell by society and they were discredited and told to be lesser than by society really helped me understand my own queer and gender, my own journey as well. It's the kind of book that made me laugh a ton. Jacob Tobias has a witty sense of humor that is both sarcastic and flamboyant and amazing in so many ways. So I laughed a lot. And I also found myself really reflecting on my own queer journey, on the way that I treat genderqueer people in my life, including myself as a genderqueer person. And it really had me thinking about the, the systems and the structures and the way in which we play small as queer and genderqueer people, as people who don't quite fit into societal norms, as people in general trying to get through in this world. It is a book that inspired me to tell more honest truths about my own gender struggles, my own struggles is even the right word, like my own gender journey and my own queer journey. It impacted me in a really beautiful way that I felt changed me. And I think that it's a beautiful book, really well written. If you're somebody who doesn't have experience with gender queerness or with, you know, queer or gender queer kids, especially if you're a parent raising a kid, I would highly suggest reading this book or listening to this book. Jacob Tobias does a really great way of making you understand what their needs were as a kid and how you can support kids who are coming out, kids and, you know, into adulthood. And I think that we don't read enough stories by hairy, masculine presenting people that wear feminine dress and feminine stuff. And I think I say it that way, not because they are genderqueer, they are feminine, they are masculine, they are both. But I say it that way because often we, we have these preconceived notions of what it looks like to be queer what it looks like to be trans, what it looks like to be genderqueer. And I think Jacob Tobias really helps us understand how our own crap we put on others can really affect our own selves and the selves and the identity and the safety that the people who, who we put our own crap on deal with, right? Like, as a queer person, I understand homophobia. As a genderqueer person, I understand gender norms, but I didn't quite get it as well as Jacob Tobias said it. I didn't, I don't have that lived experience that Jacob Tobias had. So if you're somebody who doesn't have that lived experience, and if you're somebody who does have that lived experience and you want to feel less alone, I highly suggest picking up a copy of Jacob Tobias' Sissy, A Coming of Gender Story. I really, really enjoyed hearing Jacob speak it himself. So I think uh, it's a really great recommendation for audiobook. I would definitely listen to this on audiobook. As you can see, I'm rambling because this was such a profound book. And I think we need more books written by sissies out there in the world. We need more books by people who don't look like what we want as society people to look like and dress like and act like. And instead, Jacob is actually exactly how I want someone to look like, dress like and act like. They look like my friends. They look like my colleagues. They look like the people in my life. And if they don't look like the people in your life, ask yourself why. We gender queer people, we queer people, we're out there. Jacob Tobias is out there. We There are so many people like Jacob out there in the world. 
And I think this gives a really great insight into that life and a really great perspective that I think we all could use. So if you are looking for a new book to read, a memoir to read, I would highly suggest Dick of Tobias' book, Sissy. And I really, really suggest it on audiobook. If you're going to get it through audiobook, I highly recommend using Libro.fm. Not only does that support a independent bookstore, but if you use our link that we have in the bio, you get a free audiobook and we get a free audiobook. Libro.fm is a really great alternative to that big name company that we don't like to talk about around here. And it's a great way to support a local independent bookstore and to support the School for Writers podcast. If you're more of a handheld book kind of person, we also have a bookshop.org link down in the bio for you to use as well that supports a local independent bookstore as well and supports the School for Writers podcast. Once again, if I don't care who you are. Just go out and read this book. I think that it's a really important book for anybody who wants to understand the queer and the gender queer and the sissy experience. So go grab, grab yourself a copy of Jacob Tobias memoir, Sissy. You can grab yourself a copy using the links in our bio and support the School for Writers podcast. Happy listening. Happy listening.